Chapter One, Part Ten of Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds by Charles Mackay. Volume 2. Chapter 1. The Crusades. Part 10. Fuller, in his quaint history of the Holy War, says that this crusade was done by the instinct of the devil, and he adds a reason which may provoke mirth now but which was put forth by the worthy historian in all soberness and sincerity he says quote, the devil being cloyed with the murdering of men desired a cordial of children's blood to comfort his weak stomach End quote. as epicures when tired of mutton resort to lamb for a change it appears from other authors that the preaching of the vile monks had such an effect upon these deluded children that they ran about the country exclaiming quote, o lord jesus restore thy cross to us End quote. and that neither bolts nor bars the fear of fathers nor the love of mothers was sufficient to restrain them from journeying to jerusalem the details of these strange proceedings are exceedingly meagre and confused and none of the contemporary writers who mention the subject have thought it worth while to state the names of the monks who originated the scheme or the fate they met for their wickedness two merchants of marseilles who were to have shared in the profits were it is said brought to justice for some other crime and suffered death but we are not informed whether they divulged any circumstances relating to this matter pope innocent the third does not seem to have been aware that the causes of this juvenile crusade were such as have been stated for upon being informed that numbers of them had taken the cross and were marching to the holy land he exclaimed quote, these children are awake while we sleep End quote. he imagined apparently that the mind of europe was still bent on the recovery of palestine and that the zeal of these children implied a sort of reproach upon his own lukewarmness very soon afterwards he bestirred himself with more activity and sent an encyclical letter to the clergy of christendom urging them to preach a new crusade as usual a number of adventurous nobles who had nothing else to do enrolled themselves with their retainers at a council of lateran which was held while these bands were collecting innocent announced that he himself would take the cross and lead the armies of christ to the defence of his sepulchre in all probability he would have done so for he was zealous enough but death stepped in and destroyed his project ere it was ripe his successor encouraged the crusade though he refused to accompany it and the armament continued in france england and germany no leaders of any importance joined it from the former countries andrew king of hungary was the only monarch who had leisure or inclination to leave his dominions the dukes of austria and bavaria joined him with a considerable army of germans and marching to spalatro took ship for cyprus and from thence to acre the whole conduct of the king of hungary was marked by pusillanimity and irresolution he found himself in the holy land at the head of a very efficient army the saracens were taken by surprise and were for some weeks unprepared to offer any resistance to his arms he defeated the first body sent to oppose him and marched towards mount tabor with the intention of seizing upon an important fortress which the saracens had recently constructed he arrived without impediment at the mount and might have easily taken it 
but a sudden fit of cowardice came over him and he returned to acre without striking a blow he very soon afterwards abandoned the enterprise altogether and returned to his own country tardy reinforcements arrived at intervals from europe and the duke of austria now the chief leader of the expedition had still sufficient forces at his command to trouble the saracens very seriously it was resolved by him in council with the other chiefs that the whole energy of the crusade should be directed upon egypt the seat of the saracen power in its relationship to palestine and from whence were drawn the continual levies that were brought against them by the sultan damietta which commanded the river nile and was one of the most important cities of egypt was chosen as the first point of attack the siege was forthwith commenced and carried on with considerable energy until the crusaders gained possession of a tower which projected into the middle of the stream and was looked upon as the very key of the city while congratulating themselves upon this success and wasting in revelry the time which should have been employed in turning it to further advantage they received the news of the death of the wise sultan safadin his two sons kamel and koregin divided his empire between them syria and palestine fell to the share of koregin while egypt was consigned to the other brother who had for some time exercised the functions of lieutenant of that country being unpopular among the egyptians they revolted against him giving the crusaders a finer opportunity for making a conquest than they had ever enjoyed before but quarrelsome and licentious as they had been from time immemorial they did not see that the favorable moment had come or seeing could not profit by it while they were reveling or fighting among themselves under the walls of damietta the revolt was suppressed and camel firmly established on the throne of egypt in conjunction with his brother coedrin his next care was to drive the christians from damietta and for upwards of three months they bent all their efforts to throw in supplies to the besieged or draw on the besiegers to a general engagement in neither were they successful and the famine in damietta became so dreadful that vermin of every description were thought luxuries and sold for exorbitant prices a dead dog became more valuable than a live ox in time of prosperity unwholesome food brought on disease and the city could hold out no longer for absolute want of men to defend the walls koredrin and kamel were alike interested in the preservation of so important a position and convinced of the certain fate of the city they opened a conference with the crusading chiefs offering to yield the whole of palestine to the christians upon the sole condition of the evacuation of egypt with a blindness and a wrong-headedness almost incredible these advantageous terms were refused chiefly through the persuasion of cardinal pelagius an ignorant and obstinate fanatic who urged upon the duke of austria and the french and english leaders that infidels never kept their word that their offers were deceptive and merely intended to betray the conferences were brought to an abrupt termination by the crusaders and a last attack made upon the walls of damietta the besieged made but slight resistance for they had no hope and the christians entered the city and found out of seventy thousand people but three thousand remaining so fearful had been the ravages of the twin fiends plague and famine several months were spent in damietta the climate either weakened the frames or obscured the understandings of the christians for after their conquest they lost all energy and abandoned themselves more unscrupulously than ever to riot and debauchery john of brienne who by right of his wife was the nominal sovereign of jerusalem was so disgusted with the pusillanimity arrogance and dissensions of the chiefs that he withdrew entirely from them and retired to acre large bodies also returned to europe and cardinal pelagius was left at liberty to blast the whole enterprise whenever it pleased him he managed to conciliate john of brienne 
and marched forward with these combined forces to attack cairo it was only when he had approached within a few hours march of that city that he discovered the inadequacy of his army he turned back immediately but the nile had risen since his departure the sluices were opened and there was no means of reaching damietta in this strait he sued for the peace he had formerly spurned and happily for himself found the generous brothers camel and Coredrin still willing to grant it damietta was soon afterwards given up and the cardinal returned to europe john of brienne retired to acre to mourn the loss of his kingdom embittered against the folly of his pretended friends who had ruined where they should have aided him and thus ended the sixth crusade the seventh was more successful frederick the second emperor of germany had often vowed to lead his armies to the defence of palestine but was as often deterred from the journey by matters of more pressing importance coregin was a mild and enlightened monarch and the christians of syria enjoyed repose and toleration under his rule but john of brienne was not willing to lose his kingdom without an effort and the popes in europe were ever willing to embroil the nations for the sake of extending their own power no monarch of that age was capable of rendering more effective assistance than frederick of germany to inspire him with more zeal it was proposed that he should wed the young princess violante daughter of john of brienne and heiress of the kingdom of jerusalem frederick consented with joy and eagerness the princess was brought from acre to rome without delay and her marriage celebrated on a scale of great magnificence her father john of brienne abdicated all his rights in favor of his son-in-law and jerusalem had once more a king who had not only the will but the power to enforce his claims preparations for the new crusade were immediately commenced and in the course of six months the emperor was at the head of a well-disciplined army of sixty thousand men matthew paris informs us that an army of the same amount was gathered in england and most of the writers upon the crusades adopt his statement when john of brienne was in england before his daughter's marriage with the emperor was thought of praying for the aid of henry the third and his nobles to recover his lost kingdom he did not meet with much encouragement grafton in his chronicle says quote, he departed again without any great comfort End quote. but when a man of more influence in european politics appeared upon the scene the english nobles were as ready to sacrifice themselves in the cause as they had been in the time of cor de leon the army of frederick encamped at brundusium but a pestilential disease having made its appearance among them their departure was delayed for several months in the meantime the empress violante died in childbed john of brienne who had already repented of his abdication and was besides incensed against frederick for many acts of neglect and insult no sooner saw the only tie which bound them severed by the death of his daughter than he began to bestir himself and to make interest with the pope to undo what he had done and regain the honorary crown he had renounced pope gregory the ninth a man of a proud unconciliating and revengeful character owed the emperor a grudge for many an act of disobedience to his authority and encouraged the overtures of john of brienne more than he should have done frederick however despised them both and as soon as his army was convalescent set sail for acre he had not been many days at sea when he was himself attacked with a malady and obliged to return to otranto the nearest port gregory who had by this time decided in the interest of john of brienne excommunicated the emperor for returning from so holy an expedition on any pretext whatever frederick at first treated the excommunication with supreme contempt but when he got well he gave his holiness to understand that he was not to be outraged with impunity and sent some of his troops to ravage the papal territories this however only made the matter worse and gregory dispatched messengers to palestine forbidding the faithful under severe pains and penalties 
to hold any intercourse with the excommunicated emperor thus between them both the scheme which they had so much at heart bade fair to be as effectually ruined as even the saracens could have wished frederick still continued his zeal in the crusade for he was now king of jerusalem and fought for himself and not for christendom or its representative pope gregory hearing that john of brienne was preparing to leave europe he lost no time in taking his own departure and arrived safely at acre it was here that he first experienced the evil effects of excommunication the christians of palestine refused to aid him in any way and looked with distrust if not abhorrence upon him the templars hospitallers and other knights shared at first the general feeling but they were not men to yield a blind obedience to a distant potentate especially when it compromised their own interests when therefore frederick prepared to march upon jerusalem without them they joined his banners to a man it is said that previous to quitting europe the german emperor had commenced a negotiation with the sultan camel for the restoration of the holy land and that camel who was jealous of the ambition of his brother cloredrin was willing to stipulate that effect on condition of being secured by frederick in the possession of the more important territory of egypt but before the crusaders reached palestine camel was relieved from all fears by the death of his brother he nevertheless did not think it worth while to contest with the crusaders the barren corner of the earth which had already been dyed with so much christian and saracen blood and proposed a truce of three years only stipulating in addition that the moslems should be allowed to worship freely in the temple of jerusalem this happy termination did not satisfy the bigoted christians of palestine the tolerance they sought for themselves they were not willing to extend to others and they complained bitterly of the privilege of free worship allowed to their opponents unmerited good fortune had made them insolent and they contested the right of the emperor to become a party to any treaty as long as he remained under the ecclesiastical ban frederick was disgusted with his new subjects but as the templars and hospitallers remained true to him he marched to jerusalem to be crowned all the churches were shut against him and he could not even find a priest to officiate at his coronation he had despised the papal authority too long to quail at it now when it was so unjustifiably exerted and as there was nobody to crown him he very wisely crowned himself he took the royal diadem from the altar with his own hands and boldly and proudly placed it on his brow no shouts of an applauding populace made the welkin ring no hymns of praise and triumph resounded from the ministers of religion but a thousand swords started from their scabbards to testify that their owners would defend the new monarch to the death it was hardly to be expected that he would renounce for any long period the dominion of his native land for the uneasy crown and barren soil of palestine he had seen quite enough of his new subjects before he was six months among them and more important interests called him home john of brienne openly leagued with pope gregory against him was actually employed in ravaging his territories at the head of a papal army this intelligence decided his return as a preliminary step he made those who had condemned his authority feel to their sorrow that he was their master he then set sail loaded with the curses of palestine and thus ended the seventh crusade which in spite of every obstacle and disadvantage had been productive of more real service to the holy land than any that had gone before a result solely attributable to the bravery of frederick and the generosity of the sultan camel end of chapter one part ten recording by greg giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida. Chapter 1, Part 11 of Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano.
memoirs of extraordinary popular delusions and the madness of crowds by charles mckay volume two chapter one the crusades part eleven soon after the emperor's departure a new claimant started for the throne of jerusalem in the person of alice queen of cyprus and half-sister of the mary who by her marriage had transferred her right to john of brienne the grand military orders however clung to frederick and alice was obliged to withdraw so peaceful a termination to the crusade did not give unmixed pleasure in europe the chivalry of france and england were unable to rest and long before the conclusion of the truce were collecting their armies for an eighth expedition in palestine also the contentment was far from universal many petty mohammedan states in the immediate vicinity were not parties to the truce and harassed the frontier towns incessantly the templars ever turbulent waged bitter war with the sultan of aleppo and in the end were almost exterminated so great was the slaughter among them that europe resounded with the sad story of their fate and many a noble knight took arms to prevent the total destruction of an order associated with so many high and inspiring remembrances Camel, seeing the preparations that were making thought that his generosity had been sufficiently shewn and the very day the truce was at an end assumed the offensive and marching forward to jerusalem took possession of it after routing the scanty forces of the christians before this intelligence reached europe a large body of crusaders was on the march headed by the king of navarre the duke of burgundy the count de bretagne and other leaders on their arrival they learned that jerusalem had been taken but that the sultan was dead and his kingdom torn by rival claimants to the supreme power the dissensions of their foes ought to have made them united but as in all previous crusades each feudal chief was master of his own host and acted upon his own responsibility and without reference to any general plan the consequence was that nothing could be done a temporary advantage was gained by one leader who had no means of improving it while another was defeated without means of retrieving himself thus the war lingered till the battle of gaza when the king of navarre was defeated with great loss and compelled to save himself from total destruction by entering into a hard and oppressive treaty with the emir of karak at this crisis aid arrived from england commanded by richard earl of cornwall the namesake of Cour de Leon, an inheritor of his valor his army was strong and full of hope they had confidence in themselves and in their leader and looked like men accustomed to victory their coming changed the aspect of affairs the new sultan of egypt was at war with the sultan of damascus and had not forces to oppose two armies so powerful he therefore sent messengers to meet the english earl offering an exchange of prisoners and the complete cession of the holy land richard who had not come to fight for the mere sake of fighting agreed at once to terms so advantageous and became the deliverer of palestine without striking a blow the sultan of egypt then turned his whole force against his muslim enemies and the earl of cornwall returned to europe thus ended the eighth crusade the most beneficial of all christendom had no further pretense for sending her fierce levies to the east to all appearance the holy wars were at an end the christians had entire possession of jerusalem tripoli antioch edessa acre jaffa and in fact of nearly all judea and could they have been at peace among themselves they might have overcome without great difficulty the jealousy and hostility of their neighbors a circumstance as unforeseen as it was disastrous blasted this fair prospect and reillumed for the first time the fervor and fury of the crusades genghis khan 
and his successors had swept over asia like a tropical storm overturning in their progress the landmarks of ages kingdom after kingdom was cast down as they issued innumerable from the far recesses of the north and east and among others the empire of Korsaman was overrun by these all-conquering hordes the Korsamans, a fierce uncivilized race thus driven from their homes spread themselves in their turn over the south of asia with fire and sword in search of a resting place in their impetuous course they directed themselves towards egypt whose sultan unable to withstand the swarm that had cast their longing eyes on the fertile valleys of the nile endeavoured to turn them from their course for this purpose he sent emissaries to barbaquan their leader inviting them to settle in palestine and the offer being accepted by the wild horde they entered the country before the christians received the slightest intimation of their coming it was as sudden as it was overwhelming onwards like the samum they came burning and slaying and were at the walls of jerusalem before the inhabitants had time to look round them they spared neither life nor property they slew women and children and priests at the altar and profaned even the graves of those who had slept for ages they tore down every vestige of the christian faith and committed horrors unparalleled in the history of warfare about seven thousand of the inhabitants of jerusalem sought safety and retreat but before they were out of sight the banner of the cross was hoisted upon the walls by the savage foe to decoy them back the artifice was but too successful the poor fugitives imagined that help had arrived from another direction and turned back to regain their homes nearly the whole of them were massacred and the streets of jerusalem ran with blood jaffa the templars hospitallers and teutonic knights forgot their long and bitter animosities and joined hand in hand to rout out this desolating foe they entrenched themselves in jaffa with all the chivalry of palestine that yet remained and endeavored to engage the sultans of emissa and damascus to assist them against the common enemy the aid obtained from the moslems amounted at first to only four thousand men but with these reinforcements walter of brienne the lord of jaffa resolved to give battle to the Korsmans. the conflict was as deadly as despair on the one side and unmitigated ferocity on the other could make it it lasted with varying fortune for two days when the sultan of emessa fled to his fortifications and walter of brienne fell into the enemy's hands the brave knight was suspended by the arms to a cross in the sight of the walls of jaffa and the corsaminian leader declared that he should remain in that position until the city surrendered walter raised his feeble voice not to advise surrender but to command his soldiers to hold out to the last but his gallantry was unavailing so great had been the slaughter that out of the grand array of knights there now remained but sixteen hospitallers thirty-three templars and three teutonic cavaliers these with the sad remnant of the army fled to acre and the corsamans were masters of palestine the sultans of syria preferred the christians to this fierce horde for their neighbors even the sultan of egypt began to regret the aid he had given to such barbarous foes and united with those of emissa and damascus to root them from the land the corsamans amounted to but twenty thousand men and were unable to resist the determined hostility which encompassed them on every side the sultans defeated them in several engagements and the peasantry rose up in masses to take vengeance upon them gradually their numbers were diminished no mercy was shown them in defeat barbaquan their leader was slain and after five years of desperate struggles they were finally extirpated and palestine became once more the territory of the mussulmans william longsword a short time previous to this devastating eruption louis the ninth fell sick in paris and dreamed in the delirium of his fever that he saw the christian and moslem host fighting before jerusalem and the christians defeated with great slaughter the dream made a great impression on his superstitious mind and he made a solemn vow that if he ever recovered his health 
he would take a pilgrimage to the holy land when the news of the misfortunes of palestine and the awful massacres at jerusalem and jaffa arrived in europe st louis remembered him of his dreams more persuaded than ever that it was an intimation direct from heaven he prepared to take the cross at the head of his armies and march to the deliverance of the holy sepulchre from that moment he doffed the royal mantle of purple and ermine and dressed in the sober serge becoming a pilgrim all his thoughts were directed to the fulfilment of his design and although his kingdom could but ill spare him he made every preparation to leave it pope innocent the fourth applauded his zeal and afforded him every assistance he wrote to henry the third of england to forward the cause in his dominions and called upon the clergy and laity all over europe to contribute towards it william longsword the celebrated earl of salisbury took the cross at the head of a great number of valiant knights and soldiers but the fanaticism of the people was not to be awakened either in france or england great armies were raised but the masses no longer sympathized taxation had been the great cooler of zeal it was no longer a disgrace even to a knight if he refused to take the cross rudzebuf a french minstrel who flourished about this time twelve fifty composed a dialogue between a crusader and a non-crusader which the reader will find translated in ways fabliaux the crusader uses every argument to persuade the non-crusader to take up arms and forsake everything in the holy cause but it is evident from the greater force of the arguments used by the non-crusader that he was the favorite of the minstrel to a most urgent solicitation of his friend the crusader he replies quote, i read thee right thou holdest good to the same land i straight should hie and win it back with mickle blood nor gain one foot of soil thereby while here dejected and forlorn my wife and babes are left to mourn my goodly mansion rudely marred all trusted to my dogs to guard but i fair comrade well i wot an ancient saw of pregnant wit doth bid us keep what we have got and troth i mean to follow it this being the general feeling it is not to be wondered at that louis the ninth was occupied fully three years in organizing his forces and in making the necessary preparations for his departure when all was ready he set sail for cyprus accompanied by his queen his two brothers the counts d'anjou and d'artois and a long train of the noblest chivalry of france his third brother the count de potier remained behind to collect another corps of crusaders and followed him in a few months afterwards the army united at cyprus and amounted to fifty thousand men exclusive of the english crusaders under william longsword again a pestilential disease made its appearance to which many hundreds fell victims it was in consequence found necessary to remain in cyprus until the spring louis then embarked for egypt with his whole host but a violent tempest separated his fleet and he arrived before damietta with only a few thousand men they were however impetuous and full of hope and although the sultan melek shah was drawn up on the shore with a force infinitely superior it was resolved to attempt a landing without waiting the arrival of the rest of the army louis himself in wild impatience sprang from his boat and waited on shore while his army inspired by his enthusiastic bravery followed shouting the old war cry of the first crusaders du levet du levet a panic seized the turks a body of their cavalry attempted to bear down upon the crusaders but the knights fixed their large shields deep in the sands of the shore and rested their lances upon them so they projected above and formed a barrier so imposing that the turks afraid to breast it turned round and fairly took to flight at the moment of this panic a false report was spread in the saracen host that the sultan had been slain the confusion immediately became general the derot was complete damietta itself was abandoned and the same night the victorious crusaders fixed their headquarters in that city
the soldiers who had been separated from their chief by the tempest arrived shortly afterwards and louis was in a position to justify the hope not only of the conquest of palestine but of egypt itself end of chapter one part eleven recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida chapter one part twelve of memoirs of extraordinary popular delusions and the madness of crowds volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org memoirs of extraordinary popular delusions and the madness of crowds by charles mckay volume two chapter one the crusades part twelve but too much confidence proved the bane of his army. They thought, as they had accomplished so much, that nothing more remained to be done, and gave themselves up to ease and luxury. When, by the command of Louis, they marched toward Cairo, they were no longer the same men. Success, instead of inspiring, had unnerved them. Debauchery had brought on disease, and disease was aggravated by the heat of a climate to which none of them were accustomed. Their progress towards Masora, on the road to Cairo, was checked by the Thanesian Canal, on the banks of which the Saracens were drawn up to dispute the passage. Louis gave orders that a bridge should be thrown across, and the operations commenced under cover of two cat-castles, or high movable towers. The Saracens soon destroyed them by throwing quantities of Greek fire, the artillery of that day, upon them, and Louis was forced to think of some other means of effecting his design. A peasant agreed, for a considerable bribe, to point out a ford where the army might wait across, and the Count d'Artois was dispatched with fourteen hundred men to attempt it, while Louis remained to face the Saracens with the main body of the army. The Count d'Artois got safely over and defeated the detachment that had been sent to oppose his landing. Flushed with the victory, the brave Count forgot the inferiority of his numbers, and pursued the panic-stricken enemy into Messora. He was now completely cut off from the aid of his brother crusaders, which the Moslems perceiving took courage, and returned upon him with a force swollen by the garrison of Masora, and by reinforcements from the surrounding districts. The battle now became hand to hand. The Christians fought with the energy of desperate men, but the continually increasing numbers of the foe surrounded them completely, and cut off all hope, either of victory or escape. The Count d'Artois was among the foremost of the slain, and when Louis arrived to the rescue the brave advanced guard was nearly cut to pieces. Of the fourteen hundred but three hundred remained. The fury of the battle now increased threefold. The French king and his troops performed prodigies of valor, and the Saracens under the command of the emir Kekedun fought as if they were determined to exterminate in one last decisive effort the new European swarm that had settled upon their coast. At the fall of the evening dews the Christians were masters of the field of Masora, and flattered themselves that they were the victors. Self-love would not suffer them to confess that the Saracens had withdrawn and not retreated, but their leaders were too woefully convinced that the fatal field had completed the disorganization of the Christian army, and that all hopes of future conquest were at an end. Impressed with this truth, the crusaders sued for peace. The sultan insisted upon the immediate evacuation of Damietta, and that Louis himself should be delivered as hostage for the fulfillment of the condition. His army at once refused, and the negotiations were broken off. It was now resolved to attempt a retreat, but the agile Saracens, now in the front and now in the rear, rendered it a matter of extreme difficulty, and cut off the stragglers in great numbers. Hundreds of them were drowned in the Nile, and sickness and famine worked sad ravages upon those who escaped all other casualties. Louis himself was so weakened by disease, fatigue, and discouragement that he was hardly able to sit upon his horse. In the confusion of the flight he was separated from his attendants and left a total stranger upon the sands of Egypt, sick, weary, and almost friendless. One night Geoffrey de Sergines alone attended him and led him to a miserable hut in a small village, where for several days he lay in the hourly expectation of death. 
he was at last discovered and taken prisoner by the Saracens, who treated him with all the honour due to his rank and all the pity due to his misfortunes. Under their care his health rapidly improved, and the next consideration was that of his ransom. The Saracens demanded besides money the cession of Acre, Tripoli, and other cities of Palestine. Louis unhesitatingly refused, and conducted himself with so much pride and courage that the Sultan declared he was the proudest infidel he had ever beheld. After a good deal of haggling the Sultan agreed to waive these conditions, and a treaty was finally concluded. The city of Damietta was restored, a truce of ten years agreed upon, and ten thousand golden bezants paid for the release of Louis and the liberation of all the captives. Louis then withdrew to Jaffa, and spent two years in putting that city in Caesarea, with the other possessions of the Christians in Palestine, into a proper state of defense. He then returned to his own country with great reputation as a saint, but very little as a soldier. Matthew Paris informs us, that in the year 1250, while Louis was in Egypt, thousands of the English were resolved to go to the Holy War, had not the king strictly guarded his ports and kept his people from running out of doors. When the news arrived of the reverses and captivity of the French king, their ardor cooled, and the crusade was sung of only, but not spoken of. In France a very different feeling was the result. The news of the king's capture spread consternation through the country. A fanatic monk of Citeaux suddenly appeared in the villages, preaching to the people and announcing that the Holy Virgin, accompanied by a whole army of saints and martyrs, had appeared to him and commanded him to stir up the shepherds and farm laborers to the defense of the cross. To them only was his discourse addressed, and his eloquence was such that thousands flocked around him ready to follow wherever he should leave. The pastures and the cornfields were deserted and the shepherds, or pastoreaux as they were termed, became at last so numerous as to amount to upwards of fifty thousand. Milo says one hundred thousand men. The Queen Blanche, who governed as regent during the absence of the king, encouraged at first the armies of the pastoreaux, but they soon gave way to such vile excesses that the peaceably disposed were driven to resistance. Robbery, murder, and violation marked their path and all good men assisted by the government united in putting them down. They were finally dispersed, but not before three thousand of them had been massacred. Many authors say the slaughter was still greater. The ten years' truce concluded in 1264, and St. Louis was urged by two powerful motives to undertake a second expedition for the relief of Palestine. These were fanaticism on the one hand, and a desire of retrieving his military fame on the other, which had suffered more than his parasites liked to remind him of. The Pope, of course, encouraged his design, and once more the chivalry of Europe began to bestir themselves. In 1268 Edward, the heir of the English monarchy, announced his determination to join the crusade, and the Pope, Clement IV, wrote to the prelates and clergy to aid the cause by their persuasions and their revenues. In England they agreed to contribute a tenth of their possessions, and by a parliamentary order a twentieth was taken from the corn and movables of all the laity at Michaelmas. In spite of the remonstrances of the few clear-headed statesmen who surrounded him, urging the ruin that might in consequence fall upon his then prosperous kingdom, Louis made every preparation for his departure. The warlike nobility were nothing loath, and in the spring of 1270 the king set sail with an army of sixty thousand men. He was driven by stress of weather into Sardinia, and while there a change in his plans took place. Instead of proceeding to Acre as he originally intended, he shaped his course for Tunis on the African coast. The king of Tunis had some time previously expressed himself favorably disposed towards the Christians and their religion and Louis, it appears, had hopes of converting him and securing his aid against the Sultan of Egypt. What honor would be mine, he used to say, if I could become godfather to this Mussulman king. Filled with this idea, he landed in Africa near the side of the city of Carthage, but found that he had reckoned without his host. The king of Tunis had no thoughts of renouncing his religion, nor intention of aiding the crusaders in any way. On the contrary, he opposed their landing with all the forces that could be collected on so sudden an emergency. 
The French, however, made good their first position and defeated the Moslems with considerable loss. They also gained some advantage over the reinforcements that were sent to oppose them, but an infectious flux appeared in the army and put a stop to all future victories. The soldiers died at the rate of a hundred in a day. The enemy at the same time made as great havoc as the plague. St. Louis himself was one of the first attacked by the disease. His constitution had been weakened by fatigues, and even before he left France he was unable to bear the full weight of his armor. It was soon evident to his sorrowing soldier that their beloved monarch could not long survive. He lingered for some days and died in Carthage in the fifty-sixth year of his age, deeply regretted by his army and his subjects, and leaving behind him one of the most singular reputations in history. He is the model king of ecclesiastical writers in whose eyes his very defects became virtues, because they were manifested in furtherance of their cause. More unprejudiced historians, while they condemn his fanaticism, admit that he was endowed with many high and rare qualities, that he was in no one point behind his age, and in many in advance of it. His brother, Charles of Anjou, in consequence of a revolution in Sicily, had become king of that country. Before he heard of the death of Louis, he had sailed from Messina with large reinforcements. On his landing near Carthage he advanced at the head of his army amid the martial music of drums and trumpets. He was soon informed how inopportune was his rejoicing, and shed tears before his whole army, such as no warrior would have been ashamed to shed. A peace was speedily agreed upon with the King of Tunis, and the armies of France and Sicily returned to their homes. So little favor had the crusade found in England that even the exertions of the heir to the throne had only collected a small force of fifteen hundred men. With these few Prince Edward sailed from Dover to Bordeaux, in the expectation that he would find the French king in that city. St. Louis, however, had left a few weeks previously, upon which Edward followed him to Sardinia, and afterwards to Tunis. Before his arrival in Africa, St. Louis was no more and peace had been concluded between France and Tunis. He determined, however, not to relinquish the crusade. Returning to Sicily, he passed the winter in that country, and endeavored to augment his little army. In the spring he set sail for Palestine, and arrived in safety at Acre. The Christians were torn as usual by mutual jealousies and animosities. The two great military orders were as virulent and as intractable as ever opposed to each other and to all the world. The arrival of Edward had the effect of causing them to lay aside their unworthy contention, and of uniting heart to heart in one last effort for the deliverance of their adopted country. A force of six thousand effective warriors was soon formed to join those of the English prince, and preparations were made for the renewal of hostilities. The Sultan Bibars, or Bindakdar, footnote, Mills in his history, gives the name of this chief as Al-Malik, Al-Dakar, Rakhneddin, Abulfeth, Bibars, Al-Ali, Al-Bandukare, Al-Saleh. In footnote, a fierce Mamluk, who had been placed on the throne by a bloody revolution, was at war with all his neighbors and unable for that reason to concentrate his whole strength against them. Edward took advantage of this and marching forward boldly to Nazareth, defeated the Turks and gained possession of that city. This was the whole amount of his successes. The hot weather engendered disease among his troops, and he himself, the life and soul of the expedition, fell sick among the first. He had been ill for some time, and was slowly recovering, when a messenger desired to speak with him on important matters, and to deliver some dispatches into his own hand. While the prince was occupied in examining them, the traitorous messenger drew a dagger from his belt and stabbed him in the breast. The wound fortunately was not deep, and Edward had regained a portion of his strength. He struggled with the assassin and put him to death with his own dagger, at the same time calling loudly for assistance. Footnote. The reader will recognize the incident which Sir Walter Scott has introduced into his beautiful romance, The Talisman, and which with the license claimed by poets and romancers, he represents as having befallen King Richard I, in footnote. His attendants came at his call and found him bleeding profusely and ascertained on inspection that the dagger was poisoned. 
Means were instantly taken to purify the wound, and an antidote was sent by the Grand Master of the Templars, which removed all danger from the effects of the poison. Camden, in his history, has adopted the more popular, and certainly more beautiful version of this story which says that the Princess Eleonora, in her love for her gallant husband, sucked the poison from his wound at the risk of her own life. To use the words of old Fuller, it is a pity so pretty a story should not be true, and that so sovereign a remedy as a woman's tongue anointed with the virtue of loving affection should not have performed the good deed. Edward suspected, and doubtless not without reason, that the assassin was employed by the Sultan of Egypt but it amounted to suspicion only, and by the sudden death of the assassin the principal clue to the discovery of the truth was lost for ever. Edward on his recovery prepared to resume the offensive, but the sultan, embarrassed by the defense of interests which, for the time being, he considered of more importance, made offers of peace to the crusaders. This proof of weakness on the part of the enemy was calculated to render a man of Edward's temperament more anxious to prosecute the war but he had also other interests to defend. News arrived in Palestine of the death of his father, King Henry the Third, and his presence being necessary in England, he agreed to the terms of the Sultan. These were that the Christians should be allowed to retain their possessions in the Holy Land, and that a truce of ten years should be proclaimed. Edward then set sail for England, and thus ended the last crusade. The after-fate of the Holy Land may be told in a few words. The Christians, unmindful of their past sufferings and of the jealous neighbors they had to deal with, first broke the truce by plundering some Egyptian traders near Margat. The Sultan immediately revenged the outrage by taking possession of Margat, and war once more raged between the nations. Margat made a gallant defense, but no reinforcements arrived from Europe to prevent its fall. Tripoli was the next and other cities in succession, till at last Acre was the only city of Palestine that remained in possession of the Christians. The Grand Master of the Templars collected together his small and devoted band, and with the trifling aid afforded by the King of Cyprus, prepared to defend to the death the last possession of his order. Europe was deaf to his cry for aid, the numbers of the foe were overwhelming, and devoted bravery was of no avail. In that disastrous siege the Christians were all but exterminated. The king of Cyprus fled when he saw that resistance was vain, and the Grand Master fell at the head of his knights, pierced with a hundred wounds. Seven Templars and as many Hospitallers alone escaped from the dreadful carnage. The victorious Moslems then set fire to the city, and the rule of the Christians in Palestine was brought to a close forever. This intelligence spread alarm and sorrow among the clergy of Europe, who endeavored to rouse once more the energy and enthusiasm of the nations in the cause of the Holy Land. But the popular mania had run its career, the spark of zeal had burned its appointed time, and was never again to be re-illumined. Here and there a solitary knight announced his determination to take up arms, and now and then a king gave cold encouragement to the scheme but it dropped almost as soon as spoken of to be renewed again, still more feebly at some longer interval. Now what was the grand result of all these struggles? Europe expended millions of her treasures, and the blood of two millions of her children, and a handful of quarrelsome knights retained possession of Palestine for about one hundred years. Even had Christendom retained it to this day, the advantage, if confined to that, would have been too dearly purchased. But notwithstanding the fanaticism that originated and the folly that conducted them, the Crusades were not productive of unmitigated evil. The feudal chiefs became better members of society by coming in contact in Asia with a civilization superior to their own. The people secured some small installments of their rights. Kings no longer at war with their nobility had time to pass some good laws. The human mind learned some little wisdom from hard experience and casting off the slough of superstition in which the Roman clergy had so long enveloped it, became prepared to receive the seeds of the approaching Reformation. Thus did the all-wise disposer of events bring good out of evil, and advance the civilization and ultimate happiness of the nations of the West, by means of the very fanaticism that had led them against the East. 
but the whole subject is one of absorbing interest, and if carried fully out in all its bearings, would consume more space than the plan of this work will allow. The philosophic student will draw his own conclusions, and he can have no better field for the exercise of his powers than this European madness, its advantages and disadvantages, its causes and results. End of chapter 1, part 12. Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter 2, Part 1 of Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kish. Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds by Charles McKay, Volume 2, Chapter 2. The Witch Mania, Part 1. What wrath of gods or wicked influence of tears, conspiring wretched men to afflict, hath poured on earth this noyous pestilence that mortal minds doth inwardly infect with love of blindness and of ignorance? Spencer's Tears of the Muses. Countrymen, hang her, beat her, kill her. Justice, how now? Forbear this violence. Mother Sawyer. A crew of villains, a knot of bloody hangmen, set to torment me. I know not why. Justice. Alas, neighbor Banks, are you a ringleader in mischief? Fee, to abuse an aged woman. Banks. Woman? A she-hellcat, a witch. To prove her one, we no sooner set fire on the thatch of her house, but in she came running, as if the devil had sent her in a barrel of gunpowder. Ford's Witch of Edmonton. The belief that disembodied spirits may be permitted to revisit this world has its foundation upon that sublime hope of immortality which is at once the chief solace and greatest triumph of our reason. Even if revelation did not teach us, we feel that we have that within us which shall never die, and all our experience of this life but makes us cling the more fondly to that one repaying hope. But in the early days of little knowledge, this grand belief became the source of a whole train of superstitions which, in their turn, became the font from whence flowed a deluge of blood and horror. Europe, for a period of two centuries and a half, brooded upon the idea, not only that parted spirits walked the earth to meddle in the affairs of men, but that men had power to summon evil spirits to their aid to work woe upon their fellows. An epidemic terror seized upon the nations. No man thought himself secure, either in his person or possessions, from the machinations of the devil and his agents. Every calamity that befell him he attributed to a witch. If a storm arose and blew down his barn, it was witchcraft. If his cattle died of a murrain, if disease fastened upon his limbs or death entered suddenly and snatched a beloved face from his hearth, they were not visitations of providence, but the works of some neighboring hag whose wretchedness or insanity caused the ignorant to raise their finger and point at her as a witch. The word was upon everybody's tongue. France, Italy, Germany, England, Scotland, and the far north successively ran mad upon this subject, and for a long series of years furnished their tribunals with so many trials for witchcraft that other crimes were seldom or never spoken of. Thousands upon thousands of unhappy persons fell victims to this cruel and absurd delusion. In many cities of Germany, as will be shown more fully in its due place hereafter, the average number of executions for this pretended crime was 600 annually, or two every day, if we leave out the Sundays, when it is to be supposed that even this madness refrained from its work. A misunderstanding of the famous text of the Mosaic Law thou shalt not suffer a witch to live no doubt led many conscientious men astray whose superstition warm enough before wanted but a little corroboration to blaze out with desolating fury in all ages of the world men have tried to hold converse with superior beings and to pierce by their means the secrets of futurity in the time of moses it is evident that there were impostors who trafficked upon the credulity of mankind and insulted the supreme majesty of the true God 
by pretending to the power of divination. Hence the law which Moses, by divine command, promulgated against these criminals. But it did not follow, as the superstitious monomaniacs of the Middle Ages imagined, that the Bible established the existence of the power of divination by its edicts against those who pretended to it. From the best authorities, it appears that the Hebrew word, which has been rendered venifica and witch, means a poisoner and a divineress, a dabbler in spells or fortune teller. The modern witch was a very different character and joined to her pretended power of foretelling future events that of working evil upon the life, limbs, and possessions of mankind. This power was only to be acquired by an express compact signed in blood with the devil himself, by which the wizard or witch renounced baptism and sold his or her immortal soul to the evil one without any saving clause of redemption. There are so many wondrous appearances in nature for which science and philosophy cannot even now account, that it is not surprising that, when natural laws were still less understood, men should have attributed to supernatural agency every appearance which they could not otherwise explain. The merest tyro now understands various phenomena which the wisest of old could not fathom. The schoolboy knows why, upon high mountains, there should on certain occasions appear three or four suns in the firmament at once, and why the figure of a traveller upon one eminence should be reproduced, inverted, and of a gigantic stature upon another. We all know the strange pranks which imagination can play in certain diseases, that the hypochondriac can see visions and spectres, and that there have been cases in which men were perfectly persuaded that they were teapots. Science has lifted up the veil, and rolled away all the fantastic horrors in which our forefathers shrouded these and similar cases. The man who now imagines himself a wolf is sent to the hospital instead of the stake, as in the days of the witch-mania, and earth, air, and sea are unpeopled of the grotesque spirits that were once believed to haunt them. Before entering further into the history of witchcraft, it may be as well if we consider the absurd impersonation of the evil principle formed by the monks and their legends. We must make acquaintance with the prima mobile and understand what sort of personage it was who gave the witches, in exchange for their souls, the power to torment their fellow creatures. The popular notion of the devil was that he was a large, ill-formed, hairy sprite, with horns, a long tail, cloven feet, and dragon's wings. In this shape he was constantly brought on the stage by the monks in their early miracles and mysteries. In these representations he was an important personage and answered the purpose of the clown in the modern pantomime. The great fun for the people was to see him well belabored by the saints with clubs or cudgels, and to hear him howl with pain as he limped off, maimed by the blow of some vigorous anchorite. St. Dustin generally served him the glorious trick for which he is renowned, catching hold of his nose with a pair of red-hot pinchers, till rocks and distant dells resounded with his cries. Some of the saints spat in his face to his very great annoyance, and others chopped off pieces of his tail, which, however, always grew on again. This was paying him in his own coin, and amused the populace mightily, for they all remembered the scurvy tricks he had played on them and their forefathers. It was believed that he endeavored to trip people up by laying his long, invisible tail in their way and giving it a sudden whisk when their legs were over it, that he used to get drunk and swear like a trooper and be so mischievous in his cups as to raise tempests and earthquakes, to destroy the fruits of the earth and the barns and homesteads of true believers, that he used to run invisible spits into people by way of amusing himself in the long winter evenings, and to proceed to taverns and regale himself with the best, offering in payment pieces of gold which, on the dawn of the following morning, invariably turned into slates. Sometimes, disguised as a large drake, he used to lurk among the bulrushes, and frighten the weary traveller out of his wits by his awful quack. The reader will remember the lines of Burns in his address to the devil, which so well expressed the popular notion on this point. A dreary, windy winter night, the stars shot down with skeleton light. With you myself I got a fright, a yelp the low. Yea, like a rash bush, stood in sight, with wavering sow. The cudgel in my nave did shake, each bristled hair stood like a stake. When with an eldritch stowl, 
quake, quake among the springs, away ye squattered like a drake on whistling wings. In all the stories circulated and believed about him, he was represented as an ugly, petty, mischievous spirit who rejoiced in playing off all manner of fantastic tricks upon poor humanity. Milton seems to have been the first who succeeded in giving any but a ludicrous description of him. The sublime pride, which is the quintessence of evil, was unconceived before his time. All other limners made him merely grotesque, but Milton made him awful. In this the monks showed themselves but miserable romancers, for their object undoubtedly was to represent the fiend as terrible as possible. But there was nothing grand about their Satan. On the contrary, he was a low, mean devil, whom it was easy to circumvent and find fun to play tricks with. But, as is well and eloquently remarked by a modern writer, the subject also has its serious side. An Indian deity, with its wild, distorted shape and grotesque attitude, appears merely ridiculous when separated from its accessories and viewed by daylight in a museum. But restore it to the darkness of its own hideous temple, bring back to our recollection the victims that have bled upon its altar or been crushed beneath its car, and our sense of the ridiculous subsides into aversion and horror. So, while the superstitious dreams of former times are regarded as mere speculative insanities, we may be for a moment amused with the wild incoherencies of the patients. But when we reflect that out of these hideous misconceptions of the principle of evil arose the belief in witchcraft, that this was no dead faith, but one operating on the whole being of society, urging on the wisest and the mildest to deeds of murder, or cruelties scarcely less than murder, that the learned and the beautiful, young and old, male and female, were devoted by its influence to the stake and the scaffold, every feeling disappears, except that of astonishment that such things could be, and humiliation at the thought that the delusion was as lasting as it was universal. Besides this chief personage, there was an infinite number of inferior demons, who played conspicuous parts in the creed of witchcraft. The pages of Becker, Le Lawyer, Bowden, Del Rio, and de Lancre abound with descriptions of the qualities of these imps, and the functions which were assigned them. From these authors, three of whom were commissioners for the trial of witches, and who wrote from the confessions made by the supposed criminals and the evidence delivered against them, and from the more recent work of Monsieur Jules Garnet, the following summary of the creed has been, with great pains, extracted. The student who is desirous of knowing more is referred to the works in question. He will find enough in every leaf to make his blood curdle with shame and horror. But the purity of these pages shall not be soiled by anything so ineffably humiliating and disgusting as a complete exposition of them. What is here culled will be a sufficient sample of the popular belief, and the reader would but lose time who should seek in the writings of these demonologists for more ample details. He will gain nothing by lifting the veil which covers their unutterable obscenities, unless, like Stern, he wishes to gather fresh evidence of what a beast man is. In that case he will find plenty there to convince him that the beast would be libeled by the comparison. It was thought that the earth swarmed with millions of demons of both sexes, many of whom, like the human race, traced their lineage up to Adam who after the fall was led astray by devils, assuming the forms of beautiful women to deceive him. These demons increased and multiplied among themselves with the most extraordinary rapidity. Their bodies were of the thin air, and they could pass through the hardest substances with the greatest ease. They had no fixed residence or abiding place, but were tossed to and fro in the immensity of space. When thrown together in great multitudes, they excited whirlwinds in the air and tempests in the waters, and took delight in destroying the beauty of nature and the monuments of the industry of man. Although they increased among themselves like ordinary creatures, their numbers were daily augmented by the souls of wicked men, of children stillborn, of women who died in childbed, and of persons killed in duels. The whole air was supposed to be full of them, and many unfortunate men and women drew them by the thousands into their mouths and nostrils at every inspiration, and the demons, lodging in their bowels or other parts of their bodies, tormented them with pains and diseases of every kind, and sent them frightful dreams. 
St. Gregory of Nice relates a story of a nun who forgot to say her benedicti and make the sign of the cross before she sat down to supper, and who, in consequence, swallowed a demon concealed among the leaves of a lettuce. Most persons said the number of these demons was so great that they could not be counted, but Verus asserted that they amounted to no more than seven millions four hundred and five thousand nine hundred and twenty-six and that they were divided into seventy-two companies or battalions, to each of which there was a prince or captain. They could assume any shape they pleased. When they were male, they were called incubi, and when female, succubi. They sometimes made themselves hideous, and at other times they assumed shapes of such transcendent loveliness that mortal eyes never saw beauty to compete with theirs. Although the devil and his legions could appear to mankind at any time, it was generally understood that he preferred the night between Friday and Saturday. If Satan himself appeared in human shape, he was never perfectly and in all respects like a man. He was either too black or too white, too large or too small, or some of his limbs were out of proportion to the rest of his body. Most commonly his feet were deformed, and he was obliged to curl up and conceal his tail in some part of his habiliments for, take what shape he would, he could not get rid of that encumbrance. He sometimes changed himself into a tree or a river, and upon one occasion he transformed himself into a barrister, as we learn from Verus, Book 4, Chapter 9. In the reign of Philippe le Bel, he appeared to a monk in the shape of a dark man riding a tall black horse, then as a friar, afterwards as an ass, and finally as a coach-wheel. Instances are not rare in which both he and his inferior demons have taken the form of handsome young men, and, successfully concealing their tails, have married beautiful young women, who have had children by them. Such children were easily recognizable by their continual shrieking, by their requiring five nurses to suckle them, and by their never-growing fat. All these demons were at the command of any individual who would give up his immortal soul to the prince of evil for the privilege of enjoying their services for a stated period. The wizard or witch could send them to execute the most difficult missions. Whatever the witch commanded was performed, except it was a good action, in which case the order was disobeyed, and evil worked upon it herself instead. At intervals, according to the pleasure of Satan, there was a general meeting of the demons and all the witches. This meeting was called the Sabbath, from its taking place on the Saturday, or immediately after midnight on Fridays. These Sabbaths were sometimes held for one district, sometimes for another, and once at least every year it was held on the Brocken, or among other high mountains, as a general Sabbath of the fiends for the whole of Christendom. The devil generally chose a place where four roads met as the scene of this assembly, or, if that was not convenient, the neighborhood of a lake. Upon this spot nothing would ever afterwards grow, as the hot feet of the demons and witches burnt the principle of fecundity from the earth, and rendered it barren forever. When orders had been once issued for the meeting of the Sabbath, all the wizards and witches who failed to attend it were lashed by demons with a rod made of serpents or scorpions as a punishment for their inattention or want of punctuality. In France and England the witches were supposed to ride uniformly upon broomsticks, but in Italy and Spain the devil himself, in the shape of a goat, used to transport them on his back, which lengthened or shortened according to the number of witches he was desirous of accommodating. No witch, when proceeding to the Sabbath, could get out by a door or window, were she to try ever so much. Their general mode of ingress was by the keyhole, and of egress by the chimney, up which they flew, broom and all, with the greatest ease. To prevent the absence of the witches from being noticed by their neighbors, some inferior demon was commanded to assume their shapes and lie in their beds, feigning illness, until the Sabbath was over. End of chapter 2, part 1. Recording by Kish. Chapter 2, Part 2 of Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds by Charles Mackay. Volume 2, Chapter 2, 
The Witch Mania, Part Two. When all the wizards and witches had arrived at the place of rendezvous, the infernal ceremonies of the Sabbath began. Satan, having assumed his favorite shape of a large he-goat with a face in front and another in his haunches, took his seat upon a throne, and all present in succession paid their respects to him and kissed him in his face behind. This done, he appointed a master of the ceremonies in company with whom he made a personal examination of all the wizards and the witches, to see whether they had the secret mark about them by which they were stamped as the devil's own. This mark was always insensible to pain. Those who had not yet been marked received the mark from the master of the ceremonies, the devil at the same time bestowing nicknames upon them. This done, they all began to sing and dance in the most furious manner, until someone arrived who was anxious to be admitted into their society. They were then silent for a while until the newcomer had denied his salvation, kissed the devil, spat upon the Bible, and sworn obedience to him in all things. They then began dancing again with all their might and singing these words, Allegremos, Allegremos, que gente va tenemos. In the course of an hour or two they generally became wearied of this violent exercise and then they all sat down and recounted the evil deeds they had done since their last meeting. Those who had not been malicious and mischievous enough towards their fellow creatures received personal chastisement from Satan himself who flogged them with thorns or scorpions till they were covered with blood and unable to sit or stand. When this ceremony was concluded they were all amused by a dance of toads. Thousands of these creatures sprang out of the earth and standing on their hind legs danced, while the devil played the bagpipes or the trumpet. These toads were all endowed with the faculty of speech and entreated the witches to reward them with the flesh of unbaptized babes for their exertions to give them pleasure. The witches promised compliance. The devil bade them remember to keep their word, and then stamping his foot caused all the toads to sink into the earth in an instant. The place being thus cleared, preparation was made for the banquet where all manner of disgusting things were served up and greedily devoured by the demons and witches, although the latter were sometimes regaled with choice meats and expensive wines from golden plates and crystal goblets but they were never thus favored unless they had done an extraordinary number of evil deeds since the last period of meeting. After the feast they began dancing again, but such as had no relish for any more exercise in that way amused themselves by mocking the holy sacrament of baptism. For this purpose the toads were again called up and sprinkled with filthy water, the devil making the sign of the cross and all the witches calling out, In nomine patrica, araguaco petrica, agora. Agora, Valencia, Juando Gore Gates Gustia, which meant, in the name of Patrick, Patrick of Aragon, now, now, all our ills are over. When the devil wished to be particularly amused, he made the witches strip off their clothes and dance before him, each with a cat tied round her neck, and another dangling from her body in the form of a tail. When the cock crew, they all disappeared, and the Sabbath was ended. This is a summary of the belief which prevailed for many centuries nearly all over Europe, and which is far from eradicated even at this day. It was varied in some respects in several countries, but the main points were the same in France, Germany, Great Britain, Italy, Spain, and the far north of Europe. The early annals of France abound with stories of supposed sorcery, but it was not until the time of Charlemagne that the crime acquired any great importance. This monarch, says M. Jules Garinet, had several times given orders that all necromancers, astrologers, and witches should be driven from his states. But as the number of criminals augmented daily, he found it necessary at last to resort to severer measures. In consequence, he published several edicts, which may be found at length in the Capitulaire de Balouze. By these, every sort of magic, enchantment, and witchcraft was forbidden, and the punishment of death decreed against those who in any way evoked the devil compounded love filters, afflicted either man or woman with barrenness, troubled the atmosphere, excited tempests, destroyed the fruits of the earth, dried up the milk of cows, or tormented their fellow creatures with sores and diseases. All persons found guilty of exercising these execrable arts were to be executed immediately upon conviction that the earth might be rid of the burden and curse of their presence, and those even who consulted them might be punished with death. Footnote. Monsieur Michaud, in his History of the Crusades, Monsieur Guinguin, 
in his literary history of Italy, and some other critics have objected to Tasso's poem that he has attributed to the Crusaders, a belief in magic which did not exist at the time. If these critics had referred to the edicts of Charlemagne, they would have seen that Tasso was right, and that a disposition too eager to spy out imperfections in a great work was leading themselves into error. End footnote. After this time, prosecutions for witchcraft are continually mentioned, especially by the French historians. It was a crime imputed with so much ease and repelled with so much difficulty that the powerful, whenever they wanted to ruin the weak, and could fix no other imputation upon them, had only to accuse them of witchcraft to ensure their destruction. Instances in which this crime was made the pretext for the most violent persecution, both of individuals and of communities, whose real offenses were purely political or religious, must be familiar to every reader. The extermination of the Stedinger in 1234, of the Templars from 1307 to 1313, the execution of Joan of Arc in 1429, and the unhappy scenes of Eris in 1459 are the most prominent. The first of these is perhaps the least known, but is not among the least remarkable. The following account from Dr. Cortum's interesting history of the Republican Confederacies of the Middle Ages will show the horrible convenience of imputations of witchcraft when royal or priestly wolves wanted a pretext for a quarrel with the sheep. The Frieslanders, inhabiting the district from the Weser to the Zyder Zee, had long been celebrated for their attachment to freedom and their successful struggles in its defense. As early as the eleventh century they had formed a general confederacy against the encroachment of the Normans and the Saxons, which was divided into seven Seelands, holding annually a diet under a large oak tree at Oric, near Upstelboom. Here they managed their own affairs without the control of the clergy and ambitious nobles who surrounded them to the great scandal of the latter. They already had true notions of a representative government. The deputies of the people levied the necessary taxes, deliberated on the affairs of the community, and performed, in their simple and patriarchal manner, nearly all the functions of the representative assemblies of the present day. Finally, the Archbishop of Bremen, together with the Count of Oldenburg and other neighboring potentates, formed a league against that section of the Frieslanders known by the name of the Stedinger, and succeeded after harassing them and sowing dissensions among them for many years, in bringing them under the yoke. But the Stedinger, devotedly attached to their ancient laws by which they had attained a degree of civil and religious liberty, very uncommon in that age, did not submit without a violent struggle. They arose in insurrection in the year 1204 in defense of the ancient customs of their country, refused to pay taxes to the feudal chiefs or tithes to the clergy who had forced themselves into their peaceful retreats, and drove out many of their oppressors. For a period of eight and twenty years the brave Stedinger continued the struggle single-handed against the forces of the archbishops of Bremen and the counts of Oldenburg, and destroyed in the year 1232 the strong castle of Slutterburg, near Delmenhorst built by the latter nobleman as a position from which he could send out his marauders to plunder and destroy the possessions of the peasantry. The invincible courage of these poor people proving too strong for their oppressors to cope with by the ordinary means of warfare, the Archbishop of Bremen applied to Pope Gregory the Ninth for spiritual aid against them. That prelate entered cordially into the cause, and launching forth his anathema against the Stedinger as heretics and witches, encouraged all true believers to assist in their extermination. A large body of thieves and fanatics broke into their country in the year 1233, killing and burning wherever they went, and not sparing either women or children, the sick or the aged, in their rage. The Stedinger, however, rallied in great force, routed their invaders, and killed and battled their leader, Count Burkhardt of Oldenburg, with many inferior chieftains. Again the Pope was applied to, and a crusade against the Stedinger was preached in all that part of Germany. The Pope wrote to all the bishops and leaders of the faithful an exhortation to arm, to root out from the land those abominable witches and wizards. The Stedinger, said His Holiness, seduced by the devil, have abjured all the laws of God and man, slandered the church, insulted the holy sacraments, consulted witches to raise evil spirits, shed blood like water, taken the lives of priests, and concocted an infernal scheme to propagate the worship of the devil, whom they adore under the name of Asmodi. The devil appears to them in different shapes, sometimes as a goose or duck, and at others in the figure of a pale black-eyed youth with a melancholy aspect, whose embrace fills their hearts with eternal hatred against the Holy Church of Christ. 
This devil presides at their Sabbaths when they all kiss him and dance around him. He then envelops them in total darkness, and they all, male and female, give themselves up to the grossest and most disgusting debauchery. In consequence of these letters of the Pope, the Emperor of Germany, Frederick the Second, also pronounced his ban against them. The bishops of Ratzeburg, Lübeck, Osnabrück, Munster, and Minden took up arms to exterminate them, aided by the Duke of Brabant, the Counts of Holland, of Cleves, of the Mark, of Oldenburg, of Egmond, of Diest, and many other powerful nobles. An army of forty thousand men was soon collected, which marched under the command of the Duke of Brabant into the country of the Stedinger. The latter mustered vigorously in defense of their lives and liberties, but could raise no greater force, including every man capable of bearing arms, than eleven thousand men to cope against the overwhelming numbers of their foe. They fought with the energy of despair, but all in vain. Eight thousand of them were slain on the field of battle. The whole race was exterminated, and the enraged conqueror scoured the country in all directions, slew the women and children and old men, drove away the cattle, fired the woods and cottages, and made a total waste of the land. Just as absurd and effectual was the charge brought against the Templars in 1307 when they had rendered themselves obnoxious to the potentates and prelacy of Christendom. Their wealth, their power, their pride, and their insolence had raised up enemies on every side, and every sort of accusation was made against them but failed to work their overthrow until the terrible cry of witchcraft was let loose upon them. This effected its object, and the Templars were extirpated. They were accused of having sold their souls to the devil and of celebrating all the infernal mysteries of the witches' Sabbath. It was pretended that when they admitted a novice into their order, they forced him to renounce his salvation and curse Jesus Christ, that they then made him submit to many unholy and disgusting ceremonies, and forced him to kiss the superior on the cheek, the navel, and the breech, and spit three times upon a crucifix, that all the members were forbidden to have connection with women, but might give themselves up without restraint to every species of unmentionable debauchery that when by any mischance a Templar infringed this order and a child was born, the whole order met and tossed it about like a shuttlecock from one to the other until it expired, that they then roasted it by a slow fire and with the fat which trickled from it anointed the hair and beard of a large image of the devil. It was also said that when one of the knights died his body was burnt into a powder and then mixed with wine and drunk by every member of the order. Philip the Fourth, who to exercise his own implacable hatred invented in all probability the greater part of these charges, issued orders for the immediate arrest of all the Templars in his dominions. The Pope afterwards took up the cause with almost as much fervor as the King of France, and in every part of Europe the Templars were thrown into prison and their goods and estates confiscated. Hundreds of them, when put to the rack, confessed even the most preposterous of the charges against them and by doing so increased the popular clamor and the hopes of their enemies. It is true that when removed from the rack they denied all they had previously confessed, but this circumstance only increased the outcry and was numbered as an additional crime against them. They were considered in a worse light than before and condemned forthwith to the flames as relapsed heretics. Fifty-nine of these unfortunate victims were all burned together by a slow fire in a field in the suburbs of Paris, protesting to the very last moment of their lives their innocence of the crimes imputed to them, and refusing to accept of pardon upon condition of acknowledging themselves guilty. Similar scenes were enacted in the provinces, and for four years hardly a month passed without witnessing the execution of one or more of these unhappy men. Finally, in 1313, the last scene of this tragedy closed by the burning of the Grand Master, Jacques de Molay, and his companion Guy, the commander of Normandy. Anything more atrocious it is impossible to conceive. Disgraceful alike to the monarch who originated, the pope who supported, and the age which tolerated the monstrous iniquity. That the malice of a few could invent such a charge is a humiliating thought for the lover of his species. But that millions of mankind should credit it is still more so. The execution of Joan of Arc is the next most notorious example which history affords us of the imputation of witchcraft against a political enemy. Instances of similar persecution in which this crime was made the pretext for the gratification of political or religious hatred might be multiplied to a great extent, but it is better to proceed at once to the consideration of the bull of Pope Innocent, the torch that set fire to the long-laid train and caused so fearful an explosion over the Christian world. 
It will be necessary, however, to go back for some years anterior to that event, the better to understand the motives that influenced the Church in the promulgation of that fearful document. Towards the close of the fourteenth and beginning of the fifteenth century, many witches were burned in different parts of Europe. As a natural consequence of the severe persecution, the crime, or the pretenders to it, increased. Those who found themselves accused and threatened with the penalties, if they happened to be persons of a bad and malicious disposition, wished they had the power imputed to them, that they might be revenged upon their persecutors. Numerous instances are upon record of half-crazed persons being found muttering the spells which were supposed to raise the evil one. When religion and law alike recognize the crime, it is no wonder that the weak in reason and the strong in imagination, especially when they were of a nervous temperament, fancied themselves endued with the terrible powers of which all the world was speaking. The belief of their neighbors did not lag behind their own, and execution was the speedy consequence. As the fear of witchcraft increased, the Catholic clergy strove to fix the imputation of it upon those religious sects, the pioneers of the Reformation, who began about this time to be formidable to the Church of Rome. If a charge of heresy could not ensure their destruction, that of sorcery and witchcraft never failed. In the year 1459, a devoted congregation of the Waldenses at Arras, who used to repair at night to worship God in their own manner in solitary places, fell victim to an accusation of sorcery. It was rumored in Arras that in the desert places to which they retired the devil appeared before them in human form, and read from a large book his laws and ordinances to which they all promised obedience, that he then distributed money and food among them to bind them to his service, which, done, they gave themselves up to every species of lewdness and debauchery. Upon these rumors several creditable persons in Arras were seized and imprisoned, together with a number of decrepit and idiotic old women. The rack, that convenient instrument for making the accused confess anything, was of course put in requisition. Monstrelet in his chronicle says that they were tortured until some of them admitted the truth of the whole accusations, and said besides that they had seen and recognized in their nocturnal assemblies many persons of rank, many prelates, seniors, governors of bailages, and mayors of cities being such names as the examiners had themselves suggested to the victims. Several who had been thus informed against were thrown into prison and so horribly tortured that reason fled, and in their ravings of pain they also confessed their midnight meetings with the devil, and the oaths they had taken to serve him. Upon these confessions judgment was pronounced. The poor old women, as usual in such cases, were hanged and burned in the marketplace. The more wealthy delinquents were allowed to escape upon payment of large sums. It was soon after universally recognized that these trials had been conducted in the most odious manner, and that the judges had motives of private vengeance against many of the more influential persons who had been implicated. The Parliament of Paris afterwards declared the sentence illegal and the judges iniquitous. But its array was too late to be of service even to those who paid the fine or to punish the authorities who had misconducted themselves, for it was not delivered until thirty-two years after the executions had taken place. In the meantime, accusations of witchcraft spread rapidly in France, Italy, and Germany. Strange to say that although in the first instance chiefly directed against heretics, the latter were as firm believers in the crime as even the Catholics themselves. In after times we find that the Lutherans and Calvinists became greater witch-burners than ever the Romanists had been. So deeply was the prejudice rooted. Every other point of belief was in dispute but that was considered by every sect to be as well established as the authenticity of the scriptures or the existence of a god. End of chapter 2, part 2. Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter 2, part 3 of Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Robinson. Memoirs of Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds by Charles McKay. Volume 2, Chapter 2, The Witch Mania, Part 3. But at this early period of the epidemic, the persecutions were directed by the heads of the Catholic Church. The spread of heresy betokened, it was thought, the coming of the Antichrist. 
Florimond, in his work concerning Antichrist, exposed the secret of these prosecutions. He says, quote, all who have afforded us some signs of the approach of Antichrist agree that the increase of sorcery and witchcraft is to distinguish the melancholy period of his advent. And was ever age so afflicted as ours? The seats destined for criminals in our courts of justice are blackened with persons accused of this guilt. There are not judges enough to try them. Our dungeons are gorged with them. No day passes that we do not render our tribunals bloody by the dooms which we pronounce, or in which we do not return to our homes discountenanced and terrified at the horrible confessions which we have heard. And the devil is accounted so good a master that we cannot commit so great a number of his slaves to the flames, but that there shall arise from their ashes a sufficient number to supply their place. End quote. Florimond here spoke the general opinion of the Church of Rome, but it never suggested itself to the mind of any person engaged in these trials that if it were indeed a devil who raised up so many new witches to fill the places of those consumed, it was no other than one of their own employ, the devil of persecution. But so it was. The more they burned, the more they found to burn, until it became a common prayer with women in the humbler walks of life that they might never live to grow old. It was sufficient to be aged, poor, and half-crazed to ensure death at the stake or the scaffold. In the year 1487, there was a severe storm in Switzerland, which laid waste the country for four miles around Constance. Two wretched old women, who the popular voice had long accused of witchcraft, were arrested on the preposterous charge of having raised the tempest. The rack was displayed, and the two poor creatures were extended upon it. In reply to various questions from their tormentors, they owned in their agony that they were in the constant habit of meeting the devil, and that they had sold their souls to him, and that at their command he had raised the tempest. Upon this insane and blasphemous charge they were condemned to die. In the criminal registers of Constance there stands against the name of each a simple but significant phrase, Convicta et Combusta. This case, and hundreds of others, were duly reported to the ecclesiastical powers. There happened at the time to be a pontiff at the head of the church, who had given much of his attention to the subject of witchcraft, and who, with the intention of rooting out the supposed crime, did more to increase it than any other man that ever lived. John Baptist Sibo, elected to the papacy in 1485 under the designation of Innocent the Eighth, was sincerely alarmed at the number of witches, and launched forth his terrible manifesto against them. In his celebrated bull of 1488, he called the nations of Europe to the rescue of the Church of Christ upon earth, imperiled by the arts of Satan, and set forth the horrors that had reached his ears, how that numbers of both sexes had intercourse with the infernal fiends, how by their sorceries they afflicted both man and beast, how they blighted the marriage bed, destroyed the births of women and the increase of cattle, and how they blasted the corn on the ground, the grapes in the vineyard, the fruits of the trees, and the herbs of the field. In order that criminals so atrocious might no longer pollute the earth, he appointed inquisitors in every country, armed with the apostolic power to convict and punish. It was now that the witch mania, properly so called, may be said to have fairly commenced. Immediately, a class of men sprang up in Europe, who made it the sole business of their lives to discover and burn witches. Spreger, in Germany, was the most celebrated of these national scourges. In his notorious work, The Malleus Malficarum, he laid down a regular form of trial, and appointed a course of examination by which the inquisitors in all other countries might best discover the guilty. The questions, which were always enforced by torture, were of the most absurd and disgusting nature. The inquisitors were required to ask the suspected whether they had midnight meetings with the devil, whether they attended the witch's sabbath on the Brocken, whether they had their familiar spirits, whether they could raise whirlwinds and call down the lightning, and whether they had sexual intercourse with Satan. Straight away the inquisitors set to work. Cumanus, in Italy, burned forty-one poor women in one province alone, and Spreger, in Germany, burned a number which can never be ascertained correctly, but which, it is agreed on all hands, amounted to more than five hundred in a year. The great resemblance between confessions of the unhappy victims was regarded as new proof of the existence of the crime, but this is not astonishing. The same questions from the Malleus Malficarum were put to them all, and torture never failed to induce the answer required by the Inquisitor. Numbers of people, whose imaginations were filled with these horrors, 
went further in the way of confession than even their tormentors anticipated, in the hope that they would thereby be saved from the rack and put out of their misery at once. Some confessed that they had had children by the devil, but no one who ever had been a mother gave utterance to such a frantic imagining, even in the extremity of her anguish. The childless only confessed it, and were burned instanter as unworthy to live. For fear of the zeal of the enemies of Satan should cool, successive popes appointed new commissions. One was appointed by Alexander VI in 1494, another by Leo X in 1521, and a third by Adrian VI in 1522. They were all armed with the same powers to hunt out and destroy, and executed their fearful functions but too rigidly. In Geneva alone, 500 persons were burned in the years 1515 and 1516, under the title of Protestant witches. It would appear that their chief crime was heresy, and their witchcraft merely an aggravation. Bartolomeo de Spina has a list still more fearful. He informs us that in the year 1524, no less than a thousand persons suffered death for witchcraft in the district of Como, and that, for several years afterwards, the average number of victims exceeded a hundred annually. One inquisitor, Remigius, took great credit to himself for having, during fifteen years, convicted and burned nine hundred. In France, about the year 1520, fires for the execution of witches blazed in almost every town. Danius, in his Dialogues of Witches, says they were so numerous that it would be next to impossible to tell the number of them. So deep was the thaldrum of the human mind that the friends and relatives of the accused parties looked on and approved. The wife or sister of a murderer might sympathize on his fate, but the wives and husbands of sorcerers and witches had no pity. The truth is that pity was dangerous, for it was thought no one could have compassion on the sufferings of a witch who was not a dabbler in sorcery. To have wept for a witch would have ensured the stake. In some districts, however, the exasperation of the people broke out, in spite of superstition. The inquisitor of a rural township in Piedmont burned the victims so plentifully and so fast that there was not a family in the place which did not lose a member. The people at last arose, and the inquisitor was but too happy to escape from their country with whole limbs. The archbishop of the diocese proceeded afterwards to the trial of such as the inquisitor had left in prison. Some of the charges were so utterly preposterous that the poor wretches were at once liberated. Others met a harder but the usual fate. Some of them were accused of having joined the witches' dance at midnight under a blasted oak, where they had been seen by credible people. The husbands of several of these women, two of whom were young and beautiful, swore positively that at the time stated their wives were comfortably asleep in their arms. But it was all in vain. Their word was taken, but the archbishop told them they had been deceived by the devil and their own senses. It was true they might have had the semblance of their wives in their beds, but the originals were far away at the devil's dance under the oak. The honest fellows were confounded, and their wives burned forthwith. In the year 1561, five poor women of Verneuil were accused of transforming themselves into cats, and in that shape, attending the Sabbath of the fiends, prowling around Satan, who presided over them in the form of a goat, and dancing to amuse him upon his back. They were found guilty and burned. In 1564, three wizards and a witch appeared before the presidents Salver and Daventon. They confessed, when extended on the rack, that they anointed the sheep pens with infernal unguents to kill the sheep, that they attended the Sabbath, where they saw a great black goat which spoke to them and made them kiss him, each holding a lighted candle in his hand, while he performed the ceremony. They were all executed at Poitiers. In 1571, the celebrated sorcerer, trois Echelles, was burned in the Place de Grève in Paris. He confessed, in the presence of Charles the Ninth and of the Marshal de Morcy de Ritz, and the Sieur de Maziel, physician to the king, that he could perform the most wonderful things by the aid of a devil to whom he had sold himself. He described at great length the Saturnalia of the friends, the sacrifices which they offered up, the debaucheries they committed with the young and handsome witches, and the various modes of preparing the infernal ungent for blighting cattle. He said he had upwards of twelve hundred accomplices in the crime of witchcraft in various parts of France, whom he named to the king, and many of whom were afterwards arrested and suffered execution. At Dole, two years afterwards, Gilles Garnier, a native of Lyon, 
was indicted for being a loup garou or man wolf for prowling in that shape about the country at night to devour little children the indictment against him as read by henri camus doctor of laws and counsellor of the king was to the effect that he giles garnier had seized upon a little girl twelve years of age whom he drew into a vineyard and there killed partly with his teeth and partly with his hands seeming like a wolf's paws that from thence he trailed her bleeding body along the ground with his teeth into the woods of la serre where he ate the greatest portion of her at one meal and carried the remainder home to his wife that upon another occasion eight days before the festival of all saints he was seen to seize another child in his teeth and would have devoured her had she not been rescued by the country people and that the said child died a few days afterwards of the injuries he had inflicted that fifteen days after the same festival of all saints being again in the shape of a wolf he devoured a boy thirteen years of age having previously torn off his leg and thigh with his teeth and hid them away for his breakfast on the morrow he was furthermore indicted for giving way to the same diabolical and unnatural propensities even in his shape of a man and that he had strangled a boy in a wood with the intention of eating him which crime he would have effected if he had not been seen by the neighbors and prevented giles garnier was put to the rack after fifty witnesses had deposed against him he confessed everything that was laid out to his charge he was thereupon brought back into the presence of his judges where dr camus in the name of the parliament of dole pronounced the following sentence quote, seeing that giles garnier has by the testimony of credible witnesses and by his own spontaneous confession been proved guilty of the abominable crimes of lycanthropy and witchcraft this court condemns him the said giles to be taken in a cart from this spot to the place of execution accompanied by the executioner maitre executioner de la haute justice where he by the said executioner shall be tied to a stake and burned alive and that his ashes be then scattered to the winds the court further condemns him the said giles to the cost of this prosecution End quote. given at dole this eighteenth day of january fifteen seventy three in fifteen seventy eight the parliament of paris was occupied for several days with the trial of a man named jacques rollet he also was found guilty of being a loup garou and in that shape devouring a little boy he was burnt alive in the place de greve in 1579 so much alarm was excited in the neighborhood of melun by the increase of witches and loup garou that a council was held to devise some measures to stay the evil a decree was passed that all witches and consulters with witches should be punished with death and not only those but fortune-tellers and conjurers of every kind the parliament of rouen took up the same question in the following year and decreed that the possession of a grimoire or book of spells was sufficient evidence of witchcraft and that all persons on whom such books were found should be burned alive three councils were held in different parts of france in the year fifteen eighty three all in relation to the same subject the parliament of bordeaux issued strict injunctions to all curates and clergy whatever to use redoubled efforts to root out the crime of witchcraft the parliament of tours was equally peremptory and featured the judgments of an offended god if all these dealers with the devil were not swept from the face of the land the parliament of reims was particularly severe against the nuire d'aguillette or tires of the knot people of both sexes who took pleasure in preventing the consummation of marriage that they might counteract the command of god to our first parents to increase and multiply this parliament held it to be sinful to wear amulets to preserve from witchcraft and that this practice might not be continued within its jurisdiction drew up a form of exorcism which would more effectually defeat the agents of the devil and put them to flight a case of witchcraft which created a great sensation in its day occurred in fifteen eighty eight at the village in the mountains of Auvergne, about two leagues from apchon a gentleman of that place being at his window there passed a friend of his who had been out hunting and who was then returning to his own house the gentleman asked his friend what sport he had had upon which the latter informed him that he had been attacked in the plain by a large and savage wolf which he had shot at without wounding and that he had then drawn out his hunting knife and cut off the animal's forepaw as it sprang upon his neck to devour him the huntsman upon this put his hand to his bag to pull out the paw but was shocked to find that it was a woman's hand 
with a wedding ring on her finger. The gentleman immediately recognized his wife's ring, which, says the indictment against her, made him begin to suspect some evil of her. He immediately went in search of her, and found her sitting by the fire in the kitchen, with her arm hidden underneath her apron. He tore off her apron with great vehemence, and found that she had no hand, and that the stump was even then bleeding. She was given into custody, and burnt at Rion in presence of some thousands of spectators. In the midst of these executions, rare were the gleams of mercy. Few instances are upon record of any acquittal taking place when the crime was witchcraft. The discharge of fourteen persons by the Parliament of Paris in the year 1589 is almost a solitary example of a return to reason. Fourteen persons condemned to death for witchcraft appealed against the judgment to the Parliament of Paris, which for political reasons had been exiled to Tours. The Parliament named four commissioners, Pierre Pigray, the king's surgeon, and Messieurs Leroux, Renard, and Fialso, the king's physicians, to visit and examine these witches and see whether they had the mark of the devil upon them. Picret, who relates the circumstances in his work on surgery, Book 7, Chapter 10, says the visit was made in presence of two counsellors of the court. The witches were all stripped naked, and the physicians examined their bodies very diligently, pricking them in all the marks they could find to see whether they were insensible to pain, which was always considered a certain proof of guilt. They were, however, very sensible of the pricking, and some of them called out very lustily when the pins were driven into them. Quote, we found them, continues Pierre Pigret, to be very poor, stupid people, and some of them insane. Many of them were quite indifferent about life, and one or two of them desired death as a relief for their sufferings. Our opinion was that they stood more in need of medicine than of punishment, and so we reported to the Parliament. Their case was thereupon taken into further consideration, and the Parliament, after mature counsel amongst all the members, ordered the poor creatures to be sent to their homes without inflicting any punishment upon them." Unquote. Such was the dreadful state of Italy, Germany, and France during the 16th century, which was far from being the worst crisis of the popular madness with regard to witchcraft. Let us see what was the state of England during the same period. The Reformation, which in its progress had rooted out so many errors, stopped short at this, the greatest error of all. Luther and Calvin were as firm believers in witchcraft as Pope Innocent himself, and their followers shewed themselves more zealous persecutors than the Romanists. Dr. Hutchinson, in his work on witchcraft, asserts that the mania manifested itself later in England, and raged with less virulence than on the continent. The first assertion only is true, for though the persecution began later, both in England and Scotland, its progress was as fearful as elsewhere. It was not until more than fifty years after the issuing of the bull of Innocent the Eighth that the legislature of England thought it fit to make any more severe enactments against sorcery than those already in operation. The statute of 1541 was the first that specified a particular crime of witchcraft. At a much earlier period, many persons had suffered death for sorcery, in addition to other offenses, but no executions took place for attending the witches' Sabbath, raising tempests, afflicting cattle with barrenness, and all of the fantastic trumpery of the continent. Two statutes were passed in 1551. The first, relating to false prophecies, caused mainly, no doubt, by the impositions of Elizabeth Barton, the Holy Maid of Kent, in 1534, and second against conjuration, witchcraft, and sorcery. But even this enactment did not consider witchcraft as penal in itself, and only condemned to death those who, by means of spells, incantations, or contracts with the devil, attempted the lives of their neighbors. The statute of Elizabeth in 1562 at last recognized witchcraft as a crime of the highest magnitude, whether exerted or not to the injury of the lives, limbs, and possessions of the community. From that date, the persecution may fairly be said to have commenced in England. It reached its climax in the early part of the 17th century, which was the hottest period of the mania all over Europe. End of chapter 2 Part 3. Recording by Robert Robinson.